here. 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 So our first order of business is Senate File 59, and um, State Parks is here to walk us through this bill. Director Westby, if you would introduce yourself and your companion. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Newsom and committee. It's great to see you. Uh, Darren Westby, Director of State Parks and Cultural Resources. Uh, to my left, uh, your right, is Deputy Director Dave Glenn. And uh, uh, hopefully I can carry this uh, testimony, but uh, he'll be the brain trust that tells me when I was wrong or what I missed. So if you have any questions that I can't answer, he'll definitely be the the, the bat and clean up. So I appreciate your time. Uh, Senate File 59 was an interim committee bill that we worked uh, for the most part of last year. Uh, what transpired just from a little bit of history and to refresh uh, your memory as well as uh, get some of the new members up to speed on what we worked on. Uh, what we're doing is amending 364-121-H. It's our fee bill uh, that basically uh, talks about how we can charge fees at state parks and historic sites, how the fees are used, uh, and how they can be used. Uh, this was established in 1999, 2000-ish era. And what it was established to do was to allow state parks and historic sites to use those fees for capital improvement, maintenance, and interpretation. Over the course of the next um, little while, 2015, we got a pretty significant uh, budget reduction and we asked to uh, kind of take it upon ourselves rather than close state parks or historic sites or partially close some of them. We asked to have the ability to use those fees to uh, help maintain, to offset some of that budget reduction. And so we asked for up to 25% of those fees to be used for uh, the maintenance side of the house. Um, in 2017, we had another budget reduction. And so we asked for another 5%. So it's up to 30% at that point. In 2021, we had a pretty significant budget reduction and we asked to go up to 60%, use up to 60% of those fees, not only, and the other part of the change at that point was to bring in not only the maintenance being able to use our fees to to pay for some of the maintenance items but also to include the operations piece in that so that passed um, but there was a last minute amendment that put a sunset on that and that's why we're here today um, did i say 60 percent? i'm sorry that raised it up to 60 percent but uh, there was a sunset and unfortunately that sunset ends in june of this year and that, hence why we asked for the interim topic to have the discussion to, to modify that. Um, the maintenance, if you think of what we could spend maintenance on, uh, pumping out our pit vault toilets, doing general maintenance on our facilities, uh, hiring maintenance seasonal workers. Uh, in the bill itself, there's a provision towards the end of this section that says that it can't be used for permanent salaries or bonuses or increases in permanent uh, employees. So. For the most part, it's all about seasonal workers that we can help uh, bring on during the summer uh, or winter, whenever we need the seasonal work, but also to help offset some of those costs that are in the 200 uh, section, series section. Um, what, I, I guess, just as a topic of discussion, we brought it up in the interim, and I think it's, it's compelling. If you think of Glendale State Park, for an example, on any given weekend, I'd say it's, there's probably about 30,000 people at Glendo State Park. On a good busy weekend, there's probably 35,000 people. Um, that's the third largest community in our state, all at one state park. Um, we have maybe four maintenance people. We have two law enforcement. Uh, we have, I don't know, like six water systems, several sewer systems. 
So we're basically operating a, a, a decent sized community at a state park with very minimal staff. And so the seasonal employees and the amount of costs that go into running a park like this is significant. And so our concern uh, with this bill um, and through the interim, we talked about it as well as if this doesn't pass, the implications are significant. Um, we go back to what's in the what's in the statute right now, which is up to 30% and we can only use it for maintenance. Well, that's concerning from uh, multiple reasons, but uh, we could not have, uh, what we can use the maintenance is like I talked about the utility cost of pumping out a toilet, paying for toilets and uh, toilet paper and all that kind of stuff. But the thing that we're not being able to use that for is like our fee program uh, the people that collect the fees, the people that do interpretive programming, uh, the people, our law enforcement seasonal rangers that we hire to ensure the protection of the visitors that come to our the parks and sites. Um, yeah, critical safety and enjoyment for all of our visitors. And so um, this bill uh, at, at the what we're trying to accomplish by eliminating the sunset and retaining the opportunity to have uh, operations in the definition of what we can spend these funds on is zero increase in budget. Um, we just keep operating the way we've been operating. There's no increase in general funds. There's no increase uh, as, as we go forward. And unfortunately, the, the flip side, if the bill doesn't pass, uh, we're gonna have to dig back deep and say, all right, now how do we try to come up with another million dollars um, to keep our parks and sites open, which we can't. Therefore, we're gonna have to make the hard, tough decisions on which, which parts of a state park or which state park would have to be closed or which historic site would have to be closed to compensate for that million and a half uh, in in use of those funds. And so uh, it's not a red herring that I like to throw out because I don't like to do that uh, to this body or to anybody, but it's the honest fact that um, it, it takes money to operate a state park and a historic site, and we can't do it without the use of our fees. And I just from a, a several years ago, back in 2015, it was probably one of the hardest things that we could had to do with this body was to come to you and say, Normally, we like to use all of these fees that we collect to improve our parks and to maintain our parks and to interpret our parks. However, uh, if we're getting reduced on the general fund side of the house, let, let us help keep these parks and sites open. Let us help ourselves do that job and allow us to use our fees. We didn't want to do that, but in the same token, how do you, how do you keep building and improving a park when you can't maintain it? and you can't operate it the way you'd like it to. And so that's why we came to you several times over the last uh, um, eight, nine years to help us help ourselves, keep them open uh, for the enjoyment of not only our constituents within the state, but the visiting public and the visitor demand that we're seeing. So uh, Madam Chairwoman, I, I stand for questions or I could walk you through the bill, uh, your pleasure. Thank you, Director. Any questions for Direct Westby? Yeah, so let's just go through the bill. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, page one, line eight. Uh, basically, it's the, like I said before, this bill amends uh, statute 364-121-H. Uh, again, that's our fee bill, basically. Um, on page two, lines 13 and 19, removes the June 30, 2023 20, sunset provision. Um, page two lines, I'm sorry, seven and nine, keeps the current language of the fees for use as well as the expanded definition of the operations. Um, and I already kind of talked about what these fees used to be able to uh, be used for. Uh, and then um, I, I wanted to just kind of highlight uh, the existing statute on page two lines 11 and 12, where it does talk about these funds cannot be used to cover uh, costs associated with permanent employees. So that was a conversation that was held on the other on on the other body, and as as well as during the interim about we don't want to be able to use these fees. So Dave could get a bonus, or I could hire four more full time employees. This is all if we use it on any one hundred series salaries. It's for uh, the seasonal workers that we can hire. 
And with that, Madam Chairman, that's uh, effective by July 1 this year. Any questions for Director um, Representative Winter? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Director Westby, so what you're telling us is that the 60% that you're wanting to make permanent, um, <clears throat> that's not going to affect your uh, overall expenditure or your um, appropriation, I mean, for the for the for each year. It's going to, am I right that it's just going to allow you to maintain things the way they should be and uh, let you go from year to year um, the way you are. Madam Chairwoman and Representative Winter, thank you for that question. It's probably something I glossed over a little bit. Uh, we're, we're extremely fiscally conservative at state parks and uh, kind of like what I said before, we want these funds to go to the ground for improvements and, and significant maintenance that we have at our parks. Um, the, we, we worked really hard in the language of the bill originally back in 2015 and we continue to work on that throughout this uh, even this one is that up to language is so important to us because of the fact that we want to i, I don't want to say we have to use 60 percent for maintenance and operation we can use up to 60 percent so if if we choose one year we want to really tighten the tighten the screws down because we've got a big capital construction project we can make that decision internally on where we're going to possibly do less on the operations and maintenance so we can have that money go to the ground on capital improvement or mm -hmm. some other uh, interpretive projects. Uh, we have that ability to ebb and flow, but realistically, over the past uh, year and a half, two years, uh, when it was up to 60%, we've never reached 60%. We've, I think the most we've had was like 48.5 or something like that. 40. So we haven't even hit 50%, but having the the flexibility, if we had another 2020 where we if we could have hired more people we would have loved to have hired more people because we were getting run over uh at glendo that park that i was just talking about i think we had two seasonals that's all we could hire at glendo state park is two seasonals during the busiest busiest visitation that we've ever had and those poor people uh worked their tails off in our permanent staff which we have four up there four up there um, they work around the clock uh, and so to answer your question yes uh, we want to continue to have that up to language in there and, and be able to operate the way we need to uh, to ensure that our visitor uh, experience is the way it should be follow up yes thank you madam chairman uh, could you uh, explain what hoops you have to jump through to build anything mm -hmm. major direct westby Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Representative Winner. Uh, it, the procurement process of uh, being able to hire a contractor uh, is it's set in statute, and we're very good at uh, going out and getting bids and you know designing it, getting bids. Uh, we're out in the middle of nowhere at most of these places, so just finding a contractor willing to mobilize to, let's talk about Seminole State Park, just north of Sinclair, Wyoming. Um, it's difficult just to get somebody to come out to look at a project, let alone give you a bid. And then, then uh, unfortunately, we get the probably the increased prices because of their mobilization and their travel. Uh, so yes, we're we we find a cadre of uh, good uh, contractors that are willing to work for us, love to work and do the work that we get to do, uh, and we really try to foster those relationships to try to get whatever we can out there. But to do a project is not easy, um, just with some of the regulations that we have to do, uh, the levels of thresholds in which require a contract, which don't require a contract. Uh, but I, I guess rest assured, we're, we're frugal. Uh, we don't uh, do projects if we feel that the price of the project is excessive. Uh, we'll just push it back, redesign it, uh, try to hustle a few more contractors, do whatever we can to get a respectable bid in that we can hopefully um, get the project off the ground. Representative Winter. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I apologize, but I, I just had these questions and I, uh, so do you have to come back to the legislature to uh, request funding for any major project that you're going to construct? 
Chairman Speed. Chairman Newsom, Representative Winner, we come before the uh, the committee, not the committee. We talk about our projects that we do here in, in committee, but we go in front of the Joint Appropriations Committee and get that approval and authorization to spend those funds in the capital in the you know the seven hundred series that we have. Um, yes. Else? Representative Larson. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, so I noticed that the the bill is effective July 1. That's like right in the middle of your busy season. Would it be better if it was made effective immediately? Or is that going to cause confusion with your um, budget process and all that? Director Westby. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Representative Larson, that's a good question, and I appreciate you bringing it. Uh, we're currently, uh, with the sunset of this bill, it currently ends June 30th of this year. So that's very timely of that July 1. So we just roll just as though nothing happened. Unfortunately, if this bill doesn't pass, we <laughs> I don't know what we would do, uh, to be quite honest with you. So anybody else questions? OK, um, any other public comment? I guess if you guys want to stay nearby. Uh, public comment on Senate file 59. Seeing none and nobody online. Okay. Um, we will go uh, close public comment and go to the committee. What's the pleasure of the committee? Move the bill, Move the bill by Larson. Second. Seconded by Western. Any questions? We'll just go through the bill quickly. Any changes on page one? Any changes on page two? Question being called. Barb, if you would take the roll. Representative Angelos? Aye. Representative Burkhart? Aye by absentee. Representative Byron? Aye. Representative Larson? Aye. Representative Singh? No. Representative Storer? Aye. Vice Chairman Western? Aye. Representative Winter? Aye. Madam Chairman Newsom? Aye. Seven I, one no, no, eight, eight I, sorry. Okay, um, anybody want to volunteer to take this one on the floor? Representative Storer will be taking this one. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we'll open for Senate File 88, Hunting Licenses Weighted Bonus Point System. I think Game and Fish is here and task force members, so if you all want to come up, that would be great. And I think we have a couple people online for this one. So if you would introduce yourselves. Good afternoon, men and chair Newsom and committee members. Good to be here today. Uh, my name is Angie Bruce. I'm the deputy director with Wyoming Game and Fish. As you can see, Director, director Nesbitt couldn't be with us here today, but we brought a whole team of people to fill in for him. So. Um, with that, we'll um, walk you through this bill and the impacts. Um, here with me today is our chief of our fiscal department, Greg Phipps, as well as Jennifer Doreen, who's the head of our licensing section. And also task force member um, Joe Schaefer, who's also the president of LCCC, um, as well as a task force member. Um, Senator Hicks is here as well, who was one of our task force members. Yes, and I was just checking to see if there's anyone else or anybody online um, with the task force. Rusty Bell is online. Great. So one of the co-chairs, Rusty Bell, is also um, on video. Okay. Great, and Angie. If you want to go ahead. Absolutely. And I wanted to just briefly um, refresh everyone's memory about the Wildlife Task Force and give just a brief background, and then we'll move right to the bill. Um, Governor Gordon established this task force in 2021. They spent 18 months um, in discussion and um, active public engagement. And this bill was one of the recommendations that came out of the task force, as well as 13 others. They were a recommendation body. And so therefore, their recommendations went to the agency or the body that had management authority. And of course, with this bill, then it is brought to you with the legislative session. Other recommendations might have went to the Game and Fish Commission or other um, agencies within the state. 
Um, so the public engagement was an interesting piece on this. There was, there was a lot. Every meeting was open to the public with lots of public comment. Um, there was also a virtual option. They were recorded and placed online. There was a web page created to continuously inform people. All presentations were put on that web, web page. Individual um, members had town hall meetings, especially on this particular subject. Um, and the department itself on this subject went um, went out of its way above and beyond, I believe, to do a very thorough job of engaging stakeholders with over um, 10,000 contacts to the media, um, a video recording, radio programs, publications, over 10,000 emails sent. Um, to, and then they followed that with doing a specific survey to our hunters that um, apply for preference points, both resident and non-residents, to gauge the interest in this topic. 60% um, um, of those surveyed folks um, were in favor of this change. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Greg to uh, talk specifically about the context of this bill. Mr. Phipps, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, the the issue that the task force was was uh, that that I got I had the privilege to watch them uh, grapple with was uh, you know we, we continue to have a situation of uh, increasing demand for uh, bighorn sheep and moose licenses um, <clears throat> and a declining supply so um, they looked at several options uh, to be able to try to generate a solution um, to address the need and the demand um, with our wildlife situation. And um, so the current system that's in place is a preference point system. It's been in place for 28 years. And basically, um, a sports person can get one point per year um, going through. Um, and then when you're a max point holder, for a particular area, there's some predictability that goes with that um, as far as drawing. The draw itself has preference point holders uh, in 75% of the licenses available um, and 25% is completely random. The weighted bonus point system would make it a 100% random system um, so that everyone competes randomly um, and then their number of points uh, would be weighted by squaring them um, to help with uh, for what am I trying to say uh, to help their odds or chances or uh, at, at potentially drawing a license um, the Financially, for the department, it's difficult to predict because um, we've had the same system for 28 years. So trying to uh, predict what the financial impacts would be to the department is kind of difficult. Um, so we're not really expecting a significant increase or decrease uh, in revenues because we're anticipating bonus point sales would be very similar to current preference point sales. One of the concerns um, was what do we do with um, the max point holders for sheep and moose uh, as this system, you know, if it were to pass for weighted bonus point system. And there was the task force did a ton of work um, in looking at mathematical models. And there was there was a line um, with all point holders for the most point holders. Uh, that had the highest number of points and then kind of the rest of them. So uh, so the the bill has a four year implementation period to it to allow most of those uh, maximum point holders uh, to achieve that opportunity of, of drawing a license. That's basically uh, the bill 
And then you'll also notice that I did, uh, there should be a proposed amendment that just provides more precise language uh, at a certain section of the bill. Um, and barring any questions with that, I'm more than happy to turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Any questions for Greg? Okay. Uh, John, I'm Representative Winter. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Uh, my question, I guess, is um, this is going to affect just sheep and moose? Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. Phipps. Representative Winter, uh, yes. This is this is just changing the preference point system to a weighted bonus point system for ram, bighorn, sheep, and moose. So. Uh, Follow up. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so the. Uh, Will the bonus point system sunset, or will the preference point system sunset, or how is that going to work? Mr. Phipps. Madam Chairwoman, um, Representative Winter, the, yes, during that four-year transition, we'll transition from a preference point system to a bonus point, weighted bonus point system for those two species, bighorn ram, uh, bighorn sheep ram and moose um, and then after four years it'll be a pure weighted bonus point system for those follow up <clears throat> not yet okay <laughs> any other questions uh, vice chairman western thank you madam chairwoman uh, mr Phipps. so in if you look at the, the surveys that went out those are self-reported numbers right this is like for example, you know, how many points uh, points do you have, if any? And again, these are self-reported. Do you guys not have the data showing exactly this is how many people have twenty-two points, twenty-one points, twenty, etc.? I mean, do you have that data handy, um, Mr. Phipps? I think that's a better question for Mr. Schaefer, who did the modeling. So, I don't know if you want to wait till later yeah, to I'm, answer that, or uh, happy to. So. Mr. Schaefer, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Again, my name is Joe Schaefer. Um, I'm here representing the, the task force as a member of the task force appointed to represent uh, um, public uh, resident hunters, um, but also have the opportunity uh, to take some really interesting learning examples to uh, tell Triple C and some of our students um, in our economics and statistical areas that helped us do some of the modeling. If I may, Madam Chair, let me give just a, a little bit of context and then I'll hit on some of the things that I think will help answer uh, the the vice chair's questions, but but maybe stimulate some uh, some other discussion. Uh, so one of the the first things we we learned and understood going into this is that there was just general confusion between the concepts of um, scarcity and equity. One of the fundamental things that's happened in Wyoming since the implementation of the preference point model is is the populations of these big game animals have become increasingly scarce. Over that time, we've seen the, the prevalence of wolves and predators. We've seen disease go through our, our sheep herds. And so at a time where you had relatively stable demand, we had, we had high numbers. Um, and, and so a preference model really made some sense at that time. Well, now we have a resource that's far more scarce um, with, with greater demand. And so one of the things we had to grapple with early on is understanding that we will not um, impact or address the scarcity concept of this through a draw system. There's just no way to do it. The best thing we can do to help with scarcity is uh, to put more animals on the ground. And that really comes from conservation efforts, uh, migration efforts, uh, road crossing efforts, all those good things. And so really what we're talking about is an equity thing. What system is most equitable to basically allocate these, these these scarce resources, these licenses that so many people want. And so um, keep that in the back of your mind, because one of the things we, we recognize early on is there is no system that will address scarcity and there is no perfect system with a scarce resource that we can ensure every person who wants access to one of these tags will get access to one of these tags. And that's been the fundamental challenge with the preference point model. The preference point system is intended, as, as Mr. Phipps said, is intended to give the tags, to guarantee the tags to those with the highest points. And the underlying concept is, is eventually you will have the highest points 
available and you will be guaranteed a tag. Um, and, and we can't guarantee that within the preference point model anymore. And I can go into some of the modeling we did about lifetime drawing probabilities. But given the current demand and increasing demand uh, for those tags and the number of animals we have available, um, we simply can't guarantee that you, that you would draw a tag within the the, um, within the course of your hunting life. And that was really the impetus for moving to, to something um, to something different. And so um, you're, you're probably aware there's there's really a handful of different systems uh, that states use. There's the, the preference point system, as I said, where the, the tags go to those who have preference because they have the most points. There's the pure random system, such as we have for mountain goat, uh, for bison. Um, and then there's uh, a weighted random system that, that is what's proposed for you, where essentially it's still random but every year that you apply and don't draw we give you some type of um, some type of preference or improvement in your odds by weighting your points and then there's a hybrid system with that um, within within our data what we looked at is we did see that there are a distribution of, of individuals with points and there is a point um, where we see a break and for sheep it's at about 20 points for moose it's at about 18 where you have a smaller number of individuals that have those high point totals and then from there the graphs go up and you start to see significant numbers of points um, from from there on out and so one of the things we want to do is say okay if we're going to move um, and we're looking at that you know what system makes the most sense from an equity perspective and so we modeled pure random systems we modeled just a basic bonus point system we modeled um, weighted bonus point systems. I will tell you, I think there was a lot of interest in the random system. Um, it actually doesn't model out to have the best lifetime probability odds, but just from an equity standpoint, people sort of felt that everybody should have an equal chance on, on, on the same year that they apply. The reason we went away from that, though, is we could not come up with a solution of what do you do with the people who have invested heavily in these preference points? If you wanted to go to a pure random system, you would have to essentially negate the preference points altogether. And folks have invested heavily time, years, and money in those points. And so, so you know, what do you do with them? We, we talked about phasing them out. So those, you know, don't give any more preference points. Let's just phase it out. And so if you start applying new tomorrow, you're purely random um, and we'll phase those out. And so, so they asked us, well, let's model. How long would that take? And, and this is a disclaimer. Um, modeling human behavior, predicting human behavior is incredibly complicated and trying to create a statistical model that figures out who's going to apply, when they're going to apply, how long they will apply, whether they'll drop out, which unit they will apply for is incredibly challenging. So we had to build some, some assumptions and I'd be happy to chat about those, but we essentially looked at a phasing out just based on sort of a lifetime approach. You start applying and, and you will apply until you die or you draw a tag with that. And we looked at it for bighorn sheep, it would take us 90 years to phase out preference points. And again, that's assuming in some cases people would be hunting a sheep when they were 95, 96 years old. For moose, it would be 73 years to phase out preference points. Um, when we sort of took out the aging out component of it and said, okay, but let's be realistic, people are going to age out and there's going to be some issues with that. Um, we basically figured that we could get all preference point holders out in 53 years. It's about 52 years for, for um, moose and or, uh, for sheep and then 32 years for moose. And so, so recognizing that we probably didn't want to task the department with managing a system on a phase out for the next 30 to 50 years just probably didn't make make a whole lot of sense, but yet we didn't want to discount the fact that people had these preference points. So then we modeled, well, what about um, going to a bonus point system? The, the, the value of a bonus point system is that in every year, um, anybody can draw. And in the system, I will almost guarantee you that we will have somebody draw one of these tags on their very first year. Um, but then you'll also have multiple options if you've been applying and have accumulated points, even though we can't guarantee the person with the most points will essentially draw. But we actually modeled cumulative lifetime uh, probabilities and this weighted bonus point model made the most sense. It had the highest odds both for sheep and for, for moose. Um, lifetime probability for bighorn sheep was about 21%, for moose about 24%. Um, those numbers should, should make you raise an eyebrow because no matter what we do here, the odds are not great in any given year and even over the course of your life, but they really are the best. A pure random system for sheep, we were at about 15%. For moose, we were at about just almost 16% was the lifetime probability. Not a huge difference, 
um, but a difference that allowed us to honor the preference points that people had already banked, that had already already created with that. Um, the reason we opted for the weighting, um, and so it, when we when you do a lot of the modeling, especially when you have consistent applications going through, you end up with with a real tight bell shaped curve, if you will. And so you end up without a whole lot of distribution, which means the people at the far end don't necessarily have that much more preference over the one at the, the beginning. And when we weight those, we spread the applicants out further. So actually the longer that you're in, the higher your chance of, of drawing. It actually just helps us spread the applicants. It's a system that, um, that Montana uses, I believe Nevada uses and South Dakota has gone to, and it just helps with the, the, the drawing component of that. And so, so, so Madam Chair, just in summary, you know, how we got to this recommendation um, one, we recognize we can't guarantee everybody a tag. And so to say we have a preference point system that works would, would, would be a lie. It just doesn't work with that. Phasing out the points to go to a pure random just takes too long and would burden game and fish uh, with that. Um, we wanted to honor the fact that people had preference points. And for, for some individuals, that's a significant investment. Um, and, and that the weighted um, bonus point system really has um, the best lifetime probabilities in our statistical modeling and then as, as Mr. Phipps said by delaying this four years we also give those individuals who have the highest number of points that really could draw in a preference point model the ability to, to use their points and those four years certainly on cheap would get us through the the, the highest point holders um, what we do there so uh, Madam Chair with that the last thing I would just say is one of the things we, we've all learned is um, People are very passionate about these, these issues, are very passionate about the ability to pursue these wonderful animals in a place like Wyoming. Depending on where you are at with regard to points, to your hunting career, your age, your life, and your interest, shifts the model that you would want and prefer. And so as you can imagine, um, every individual brings a unique perspective to this debate. One of the biggest challenges we had as task force is trying to find a solution that somehow was um, the, the most equitable, if you will, across all these populations. So Madam Chair, happy to, to stand for any questions. Do you have a follow-up, Vice Chairman Western? I do, thank you, Chairwoman Newsom. Um, Mr. Schaefer, I, so you, you said that that we can't guarantee a draw. Um, I, I, please forgive me, but if we just kind of look at the draws, if you go on Game of Fish's website, certainly for the last season, um, there were a lot of people who were guaranteed draws. For example, in Area 5, if you had 24 points, 23 points, 22 points, everyone who applied for that tag had 100% odds of drawing. So, I, I, yeah, I just, I, I kind of have to push back a little bit on that. But my question, though, is is this, is, I certainly agree. Look, we have a the, the supply of these animals is declining, and obviously that's not good. And I appreciate Game and Fish's efforts to really try to reverse that trend. The concern is, I think people confuse most fair with the perfect system, right? And I think a lot of respondents, you know, they want something that works perfectly for them, you know. But by virtue of these being such scarce animals, and while still trying to offer sporting opportunities, I think there's that delineation between something that is the most fair. It may not be fair. As from a uh, from a perception standpoint, but in terms of fair for everybody who wants to participate, I think that's the concern there. And that if we shift to this system, we might be uh, leaving some kind of folks in the dust. And so, and for example, if I have 22, 23, 24 points, those those high categories, um, and if we use this this squared system, wouldn't I statistically have a much less chance again, based off the draws we have now? And what we just what the data is telling us, the people who are drawing, and based on those point quotas, wouldn't I have a lot less chance of drawing, based on the sheer number of applicants, right? Kind of having uh, application crowding, if you will, than if, say, if four people apply for Area Five with twenty-one plus points, versus eighty to hundred people applying, who've got anywhere from eight to twelve. So statistically, aren't we kind of disadvantaging those those high point holders versus the ones who have half as many points, say? Yeah, Madam Mr. Chair. Schaefer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Western. So, so fantastic questions and, and points. Um, let me clarify. Right now, for certain applicants, the system will guarantee you a draw, without a doubt. So if you have 25 points for sheep, um, you can draw a sheep tag today. The challenge comes if we perpetuate a preference point system, if, if, if my 12-year-old starts applying this year for a sheep tag, 
in the preference point model, her lifetime probability under that model is, is about 15, 16% of ever drawing a tag. And that's if she draw, applies every single year and applies um, through the age of 65. So even doing all of those things, we cannot guarantee her a tag. But those that have the highest points, we can, and this will get to your second question. It's one of the reasons why the task force said, let's delay the implementation. So those people that in the current system could be guaranteed a tag if they choose. It's interesting. We have people with max points who haven't actually applied for a tag for the last three or four years. If they choose can be guaranteed a tag. Your point is correct though. So for somebody who's the highest point holders right now, let's say they decide over the next four years before this is implemented that we will not, or that they aren't gonna apply. They're not gonna apply for their sheep or their moose tag. When it shifts to a bonus point system, they will no longer be guaranteed a tag, which means their odds for drawing a tag could, will go down would be my guess. Um, but we wanted to give them that choice, wait and, and see with less odds or guarantee that you'll get a tag by delaying its implementation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that kind of gets at the crux of it is that I think it's fine if we shift to a system, if we can guarantee that maybe their odds won't go up, but their odds at least won't go down. And certainly significantly, right? Where, for example, again, if we use the kind of the example, so let's say we've got two people with 24 points apply, three people with 23 apply, 13 people with 22 apply, which is the exact numbers we saw for area five last year. That's a total, and we use the, the, the squared system, that's a total of about 4,000 points that they get to accumulate. But let's say we have 100 people with 10 points, so we're in kind of that eight to 12 range, just to kind of average it out, that's 10,000 points that that, that that category of folks are getting. 10,000 versus 4,000, you know, I'm not uh, hardly a, 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 I wasn't a, a stats major in college, but you know, the trend is pretty clear. And so I think that there's this, in, I mean, and just to be totally honest, I have 18 points. So, you know, if, uh, forgive me if I get a little <clears throat> uh, amped up about this, but um, <laughs> the concern is that we are leaving some of these folks, uh, that they really are getting kind of the, the short end of the deal here. Um, and I, I fully appreciate, look, nothing's fair, but I think, as this bill as written uh, sets up a, a system in which the folks who have been waiting in line for two decades plus are all of a sudden kind of put towards the middle of the line and maybe even that back half. Um, and so I, I certainly appreciate that. But my guess, my question would be, do you see a way where we really could enable that at least none of these folks are going to be said that their draws won't significantly drop, you know, that 10, 20, 30 percent drop? Thank you. Um, Senator Hicks wants to weigh in on this. So if you could join us at the table, help, Senator Hicks. Uh, help, uh, Why don't you pull up a chair yeah, and we'll just, or if some of the Game and Fish folks want to give. So, Madam Chairman, I would, I Angie, would call why your attention you to uh, the back, the last page on page 11. I think this will, will help Representative Western understand what Joe was trying to describe. So this gets to the effective date. So if you go to page 11, line three, is except as provided in this section, this act is effective January 1st for 2027. So anybody that's at that upper end, we're gonna maintain the preference point system. And Joe's got the graphics you can show. So most likely um, anybody that's that's got you don't even have, as you alluded, 22 points is all it took last year. You're going to have 23, 24, 25, 26, four more years that the preference point stays in place. So those people that are vested in there, they're all going to have a potential opportunity. So if you're at 18 points and you had 14, you're at 22. The last year, area five was the hardest out of all of the one through five, you could have drawn two different units with 19 points, uh, which was, I believe, three and four. The point being, we recognize that when you look at the, exactly what he said, how many people have points? How many have 27, 26, 25, 24? And that's what led us to the conclusion that that four years, most of those people will all draw a sheep permit if they choose to go sheep hunting. Now, they may say, I am only going to apply for this unit. That's a personal decision. The opportunity for the next four years 
those people that have those points will be able to use those and draw. So that's to honor that commitment. What happens when you get out past four years, the numbers explode. And at that point in time, it no longer, regardless of how long we run it out, but for the next four years, those people that are in the same potential situation, they should draw a sheep permit if they choose to hunt in those areas that those permits are available. But that's a personal choice. But the graphic shows that based on exactly the information you talked about, how many have 27, 26. And I think it's exactly what uh, Dr. Schaefer was talking about. That's that where you see in the data. That's where the natural break occurs. After four years, you can run the preference points and you can't guarantee anything. It just comes to the point where it doesn't work anymore. I hope that effective Dave illustrates that you've, you've got four years and under those numbers, most of those people are going to draw those sheep permits. Follow up, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Newsom. And I, I fully appreciate that, but again, it still doesn't solve for the problem that can we ensure that every last one of those, those high point holders isn't in a situation where they're getting directed to the back of the line. And I, I, again, I, I appreciate the intent of the delay. And, to an extent, I certainly agree it makes sense, but if I have 19 points now, all of a sudden I'm graduating into these, or 18 points, or when you're right there on the cusp of being in kind of that elite or you know, that top point class, don't you think that they would put those folks upon that this effective date, that all of a sudden they're going right to the back of the line? And even though leading up to that, they might not be in a point where they can have a statistically decent odds of, of drawing, not the top areas, but even the you know, semi-desirable areas. I mean, I think they're all desirable, right? But you know what I'm saying? I think it, it, even those f folks get stuck to the back of the line or how would we address that? Madam um, Chair. Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, um, Representative Western. Actually, the, so the model we're moving to, if you want to look at who would be disadvantaged the most, it would be your first year applicants. Um, and we debated that to an extent and about if you were going to do that, who might appreciate or might not appreciate one of these hunts most. My 12 year old daughter probably isn't at that point being drug up the sheep hill to go find a big horn sheep may not appreciate it as much. They're actually the ones statistically that would be disadvantaged the most. Once we clear out those high point holders over the next four years, sitting with 18 points, those 18 points are then squared as you go into the draw. Your odds of drawing actually are far better than somebody with one, two, three, or four, or five points just by the model. Does it guarantee? Absolutely not. As I said, I, I would almost guarantee you that there will be somebody who draws on their very first year and somebody with met those high end points that won't draw because of the way the system works. But but your odds actually are better than anybody else's in the group, assuming we clear out those highest point holders. Rep, uh, Representative Western. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I deeply appreciate the indulgence. Um, Mr. Schaefer, I, I appreciate that. But aren't you concerned that for those folks that do again, we we're put right back in that problem that you acknowledge is, is true where there's you know three or four folks who've got that that 20 plus point then now all of a sudden we've got 80 to 100 who've got that 8 to 12 and again we get back into what i call the kind of the application crowd out uh that kind of situation occurs would we not be kind of back in that situation under the scenario you just described Madam, Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Western. Without a doubt, and it goes back to the scarcity issue. As long as the demand for a scarce resource is so far out of whack with the supply, and if that supply doesn't increase, in fact, as we've seen, if it decreases and demand increases, we get what people love to call this point creeps, where it just makes it harder and harder and harder to draw. And there, there is no system that truly would address it. As I said, some folks, that's one of the arguments where they said, let's just move to a fully random system. And I wouldn't doubt that we would be there if we didn't have these legacy point holders. Any other questions from the committee? Representative Byron. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I Mr. Schaefer, uh, I'm not going to tell you how many points I have because it's less than um, the good representative Sheridan. But if I had 14 points and and this this situation applied, um, is it? Can you just clear up the the four year phase out if you want to call it that? Um, at that fourth year, do you retain your bonus points, 
um, moving forward um, for, you know, into 28, 29, 30, 31, you know, 2050, it sounds like, but do you retain that bonus points or do those get phased out as well? Just a clarity there. Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Byron. Um, so perfect example is, hey, this is all very personal depending on where we're at. So I happen to be in about your bank too, and I look at it, what does this mean for me? But but the lens is very separate. Um, no, they do not. What happens after that four year, when this bill becomes effective, essentially this law goes into effect, anybody who has existing preference points, those will be converted to bonus points. They will be with you until you draw or until you to pull out of the drawing process um, with that. It's just that the system will then take your points every year you apply, we'll, we'll square those, then add one for your annual application. That's how many entries you get into the hat then. And so the more entries you have, um, statistically speaking, the more likely that you are to draw that tag. Not guaranteed, but more likely. Yeah. Follow up. Anybody else questions? Uh, Representative Angelus. So I, I Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I actually have a question for you. Pretty basic. How many sheep tags do you actually issue out the state of Wyoming? How many people apply? Mr. Phipps, you have that? Madam, Madam Chair. Absolutely, go ahead. Representative Anselos. Um, so here's just quick supply and demand numbers here in 2008 2008 granted there was 244 bighorn sheep licenses issued in 2022 there were 180 um, in 2008 for the bighorn sheep licenses there were 7198 applicants in 2022 there were 9478 applicants Follow up. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. That does uh, shed some light on the, the topic. The other question I have has: Have you guys ever just uh, thought about going letting people choose what system they could be a part of to maybe spread the fairness out? Who wants that one? <laughs> Senator Hicks. Madam Chairwoman. Um, we looked at every conceivable alternative possible. And then when the public commented, we would look at those and say, but well, we looked at, you know, you can choose to go into a bonus point. You can choose to keep your system and the complexity becomes almost impossible to manage that because then how do you distribute those permits? You know, somebody has been applying for 25 years and invested $2,000 in buying points. And then we say, but you get to choose, but we looked at bonus points, choosing bonus points and preference points, and you could keep those and then random draws. And we decided what happens if we split it instead of the 75, 25 preference random to go to 50, 50. I would tell you, we looked at every state system. We looked at every system that was promoted by members of the public that brought them to the task force and run through and it just comes back. <clears throat> And I was never a, a proponent of the weighted bonus system, but you can't argue with the statistics, <clears throat> the numbers of the numbers. And it, it, it came to the point for myself, it was an equity issue. We can continue what we're doing, but that is just such a disservice to all those people with 15 or less points. Um, <clears throat> what you see is most people can't even apply or don't apply because they're stationed in life. A lot of people don't start applying until they're in their 30s and 40s, either economically or for family issues. They just can't take the time out with their work related. So then you say, well, <clears throat> we maintain this preference point system and, and you're at Representative Byron's age with 14 points. I hope you're in good shape when 70 when you're guaranteed that tag because realistically we looked at that we're going to age a lot of people that have made a long term investment into this and that's where it gets back to the equity for those long term holders and those new people and it's just difficult but to specifically answer the question I don't think there's been a group of individuals that looked at more different types of potential systems in the United States. It was unprecedented level of work to look at everything that's out there. Follow up? No? 
Okay, any other questions? Representative Burkhardt. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. So, Mr. Schaefer, uh, having a lot more points than the good Vice Chairman, does that mean I have a better chance of drawing? Uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, Representative Burkhardt. Um, testifying on record to give you any type of guarantee scares me, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest. Uh, but yes. Thank you. If and when we get there, you will have a better chance because you have more points. Thank you. Yeah. Hold up. Other questions, Vice Chairman? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I guess Senator Hicks, Mr. Schaefer, again, I, I fully appreciate that. But if you kind of look at the math that was provided, there's right around 500 or so folks, 600, who are in that upper class component. Is, is there really no way that we can ensure that, that these people are kept whole, but also addressing or trying to at least increase the, the drawing opportunity for those folks who have you know, sub 10 points or around thereof? Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, Madam Chair, Representative Western, if I'm understanding the correct question correctly, um, we, we debated that, where do you draw that line? Which one for sheep, for moose? And was there a line where we'd say, we would only let those with 20 or more ever apply as preference point. Everybody else had to shift with that. Um, and there is a demarcation in the data to do that. But then those people that were right on the cusp on the other side were upset. And then the people even with 20 wondered, but will I get the unit that I want to draw, not just anyone? I don't want, I can't go and hunt um, area three for sheep. I'm not physically able versus wanting to draw something like, like, like porcupine or some of the other units. So we discussed, do you draw a line and say, everybody below this, you're going to get there. And I guess what I would say is the task force just wasn't comfortable making sort of that arbitrary decision of, of determining who gets what. Um, and so the best solution we said is let's empower the people with the highest points. And the best way we can empower them to make their own choice is by delaying the implementation of the bill. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, do you think that if we did like a, you know, kind of a demarcator that took that 50%, say not keep the preference point for those high folks, but use the bonus point system, but create their own class of saying, okay, if you have, I don't know, above 18 or above 20, we still put you in this, because uh, we'll put you in this class where your odds are still 70, 80% plus, because under this right now, your odds of drawing go from 80 to 100 to less than 50%, even less than 40%, depending on the unit and all that kind of those variables. So do you think a hybrid kind of example where we just said, okay, we'll delineate half these tags go to folks with this point or less, half them go to that point or more, and we'll do the system for, for five years or, or six years or however many years until we all those folks have actually been not necessarily their top choice, but a, a area. Uh, Senator Hicks. So, Madam Chairman, if you do that, and we looked at those scenarios, <clears throat> but what happens is because it, you've now limited the number of tags for those high point, point holders, they drag on and on and on. So somebody that like you, that that uh, somebody, let's just say somebody that has 18, <clears throat> right now under the preference point system, you're allocated 75%. So if we take half, another 25% of those away, rather than you being guaranteed to draw a tag in the next four years, it may be the next 10 years because of the number, again, reducing the permits. So it, it actually prejudiced against those people for the that have the highest number of points because there's fewer tags to draw at. So if you just split the tags 50-50, 50% 50, 50, 50 go to the bonus and you use the 15 cutoff under our current system, that's moving 25% of those tags into there. And so those higher point holders are going to have a less opportunity to draw because there's just fewer tags in that higher, in that preference point draw. So again, I can't imagine a scenario that we did not run through looking at those type of systems. Any other questions? <clears throat> Representative Winter. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, in my estimation, this is a perfect example of what we what happens when you start playing games. <clears throat> and uh, but our we're in the situations we need to take care of these folks that have been putting in. They, there's a contract with them, and we need to honor that. I think. <clears throat> but my other question is, how is this whole effort going to affect the departments of uh, funding? 
Mr. Phipps, I think that's for you. Madam Chair, Representative Winner, um, it's difficult to predict who's going to participate in preference points and bonus points. Um, but as far as laying out expenses um, to implement the system, you know, we're looking at in FY24, uh, probably $33,580 is our estimate. And that takes care of programming uh, our systems, um, changing our references, our publications, our applications, and also communicating to the public. Um, then in subsequent years, 25 through 26, uh, about $9,000 a year, just to keep those ongoing communications going to the public um, about the transition to the weighted bonus point system. Hello? Um, Representative Storer. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I'm just curious how you ar arrived at the um, squaring the number as the formula. Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Storr. Um, honestly, looking at successful models in other states, such as Montana and South Dakota, we could have doubled them. We could have done another uh, applicator. The, the squaring has been successful, successful in spreading out the applicants in states that have gone to or had this model. Um, and and we, we basically said, let's replicate something that's working elsewhere. Follow up. Representative Angelis. Um, I, Madam Chair, I actually have a question for you. How many, because I think it, it would help us kind of equalize it. In Montana, do you know how many uh, tags they issue out of there and how many applicants? Do you guys have that data? Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, um, Madam Chair, thank you, uh, Representative Angel. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if the department does, um, but but we can get those data. They're publicly available and, and they're, um, they're replicable. There, there's certain things that, that are different with Montana and we don't have to go into it the way they allocate by region versus by unit. So there will be some nuances, but those data are available. And if you want to see comparative what, what's happening there with their sheep and, and moose applications and, and probably with some other states as well. Yeah, follow Madam, up, follow Madam up. Chairwoman, oh, I would just Senator add Hicks. on to that. I don't have the exact numbers. There's fewer sheep licenses and more applicants. That I know for a fact. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I was just curious if the model that you guys um, used was similar just with the amount of tags, if that kind of made it similar if you were comparing it to other states. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Any other questions? So what I heard, I heard a, I had a public meeting on this um, back in November, I think, and um, Mr. Schaefer was gracious enough to be online and um, one of our people that are online now, Rusty Bell, he was gracious enough to be there. And um, what I heard over and over is, you know, I don't really care if I draw, but I really care if my neighbor draws twice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that seemed to be the overwhelming um, talk about, about how this might change how we do our bonus point system. Um, I think if you guys want to stay close, is there any other public comment on this particular issue? No? Okay, so we'll move it to the committee. What's the pleasure of the committee? I uh, will close public testimony. Madam Chairman, oh, we, else oh yes, we have the folks online. Up. Would you like him to come? Into yes, the room? please. Sorry about that. Is um Bill Novotny on still? He's on, but his hand is not raised. Okay, Bill, if you want to be on with us, raise your hand. Okay, so let's bring them both in. Um, we'll start with you, Rusty, if you want to go ahead, um, your name, who you're with. Thank you, uh, Chairman Newsom. Um, members of committee, Rusty Bell, uh, co-chair of the uh, Wildlife Task Force this last uh, 18 months. Um, and thanks to uh, the fellow task force members that did all the heavy lifting on this and Joe and, and uh, Senator Hicks and, and the department staff for answering all those tough questions. I feel like I was uh, reliving the last 18 months again. One thing that we did not track um, was how much time the 18 individuals and the, the uh, department staff spent on this these exact same questions that I'm that I'm listening to the uh, uh, the committee ask. Um, and, and just to reiterate, 
uh, that, that there is no per perfect system and, and I'm in the same point uh, structure as, as Representative Western. And so, as you might figure, I asked all kinds of hard questions and we, we wanted to try to find a, a system that was, that was acceptable to every single person. And, and I can guarantee that that's not possible. Um, but we did do, uh, we did do a, a, a lot of work, hundreds and hundreds of hours on this over 18 months. Um, we also, this is a committee bill, so we actually um, testified on these same, some of these same things to the, to the previous TRW committee in, in Thermopolis. And, and, and I appreciate all the questions. Um, we really did try to top to bottom look at this and, and come up with um, really what, uh, what Joe talked about was, was the best system possible, um, knowing that there's not a perfect system. So um, I would stand for any questions. I know that when this came out of the task force, it was a 16 to two vote. Um, from our 18 members. And so uh, I think that's really all that I could add, um, but I would certainly stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Bell? Seeing none, I guess we'll go to Mr. Novotny. Wanna thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you. I apologize that I'm testifying remotely. I had to go out to Washington, D.C. for a National Association of Counties meeting. So uh, my name is Bill Novotny, speaking on behalf of the Wyoming Outfitters and Guides Association. Uh, we had membership on the task force. Our members were actually the, the two votes in opposition. Uh, and there's been a great deal of discussion about uh, hunting of bighorn sheep. But the biggest heartburn that my membership has is actually when it comes to individuals that they have built relationships as clients who are moose hunters uh, and moose hunters who have worked uh, for years to accumulate the points with the hopes of hunting moose in the Pinedale area. And unfortunately, they fall into that uh, max point uh, area, but just haven't been able to draw. Um, so with uh, just the upheavals that have happened within the hunting industry over the last uh, several years, uh, whether it was once in a lifetime, the uh, switch to 9010 on the big five, we really feel that it would be appropriate to allow the system to settle out. Uh, you've made some fundamental changes in the way licenses are allocated in the last couple of years. So our hope uh, is that you will either move this beyond the 2027 date or, or uh, defeat this bill, take it to the interim and continue work on this subject. So uh, with that, Again, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to testify remotely. Good to have you here. Um, any questions for Mr. Novotny? Nope, I guess we're good. Thank you both for being here. Appreciate it. Um, so any other, we don't have anybody else online, Barb? Okay, any other public comment in the room? All right, so I guess we will close public comment. And what's the pleasure of the committee? Move by Larson. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Larson, seconded by Burkhart. So if I could get um, maybe Game and Fish to come back up and go over the bill and possibly your amendment. Looks like you drew the short straw, Mr. Phipps. <laughs> Indeed, Madam Chair. Um, so this, uh, the proposed amendment is really just providing some precision of language uh, towards the bottom of page four. <clears throat> if we look at uh, page four, line, line 22, um, we'll delete the entire line and insert resulting in the weighted bonus points entered into the random and then go to line 23 and delete that entire line. And then on the top of page five, line one, delete drawing. And those changes in its entirety would make that last paragraph read, a license applicant's bonus points are then squared, resulting in the weighted bonus points entered into the random drawing so it just it just provides some precision um, to the language that exists there 
and, and that's just for clarification to make it more clear how that's going to work. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, Representative Larson. Uh, I'd move the pre amendment as presented. Is our second? Second. Uh, moved by Larson, seconded by Storer to add the amendment as presented. Are there, is there any questions? Um, so um, all those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. Okay, that'll carry forward. Then, um, Mr. Phipps, do you want to continue to go through the bill, just highlighting those things that are changed? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, page one, no changes. Uh, page two, it adds in bonus point in um, several, in three areas. Page three is just adding the bonus point language. Page four adds bonus points and weighted bonus points. Um, and speaks specifically to, uh, you know, moose and ram bighorn sheep um, and the application of a weighted bonus point system. The clarifying language from the amendment we previously discussed. Page five, um, the again, for the specific species of moose and bighorn and ram bighorn sheep, um, and adds the language from bonus points or correction for the weighted bonus point uh, drawing and strikes the language for the preference points, the previous preference point language. Page six. Um, adds in the bonus point piece and this the again specificity to moose and ram bighorn sheep. The uh, line seven on line two, uh, instead of any particular species, uh, it retains the preference point uh, system specifically for antelope deer and elk. Um, and further down on line 18, um, speaks to the bonus point for uh, the, the fee section. Page eight, uh, again, uh, bonus point additions, the uh, and specificity for ram, bighorn, sheep, and non-resident moose. Page nine adds in the bonus point language. Um, and on line 17, page nine, it talks to the weighted bonus point system and the random draw as opposed to the 75-25 split. Um, page 10 at the top uh, adds in bonus point and those are all the changes, Madam Chair. So committee, um, I guess we'll just go through the bill. Does, does anybody have any other amendments that they would like to bring? Representative Storer. I just have a question. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm just trying to understand the change that is on the bottom of page six and top of page seven where um, it says a program established pursuant to this subsection may be implemented um, for antelope, deer, and elk. I just, I just want to make sure I understand what's happening there. Mr. Madam Fitz. Chair, um, Representative Storer, so that's the uh, previous language of the bill when all the particular species were under the preference point system. And since this bill uh, applies the weighted bonus point systems towards moose and ram bighorn sheep. Um, that's the language that that's left over. We kept for those particular species. We had to delineate them uh, for antelope, deer, and elk. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Any other questions or any other anticipated um, um, amendments? Or, no? Okay. Um, Representative Burkhart. Comments? Yes. Okay. So, Madam Chairman, uh, Senator, over the years, Senator Hicks and I, and I see Senator Hicks has left, have talked about this issue. I actually, a number of years ago, had a bill uh, to eliminate the bonus, the point system. Mine was much more draconian than this one. It was pretty much just eliminate them where they are and call it good and go back to the random system because there is no good system. The people who have a lot of points, yes, they want a license. Those who have few points, will probably never draw a license. And I understand all of that. I think the, the task force spent a lot of time and a lot of effort on this, and we need to give them the benefit of the doubt on what they've done and the amount of effort they've put into it. So those are just my thoughts. Any other comments on the bill? Representative Angelis. Yeah, I, I definitely, Madam Chair. I can see that the task force has put a lot of time and effort into this, and this is kind of a no-win situation for everybody. I don't know how I'm going to vote on the floor. Um, I'll, I'll be a, a yes vote to get this out here, but I would like to hear more discussion on the floor. So, uh, yeah. Great. Representative Western. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I, I do agree. I, you know, that's That was tough, arduous work where it was, you know, someone's going to be mad at you no matter what. I fully appreciate that. I, I guess I just am kind of hung up on Again, the folks who have kind of been in line, I actually looked it up the, what the actual numbers are, not what the survey says. And these are 2023 numbers. For the 20 and up point class, there's about 1,000 people who are, as of right now, who have 20 or more points. And if you look at the preceding four, the in 19, 18, 17, and 16, it's another 1,000. So we're looking at a pretty large population of folks here, I think, that that stand to go from, again, relatively high high draw odds of 80 plus percent uh, to being really low, to being sub 50, which again, I, I think if it was dropping five or 10%, I can appreciate that. We all try to gotta work together to make something happen, but when you're damaging their draw, it's that significant. I think there's just kind of that concern there. And that's 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 my, my worry here. And that's why I was hoping we could flesh out an option forward to address or largely address most of those needs. But I think just as of right now, the people who stand to, to really get the short end of the deal here is just too big for me to be comfortable to move, <clears throat> to move forward. Any other comments? Representative Burkhart. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Let me say this, I probably have uh, more points than anybody on the committee other than maybe uh, Representative Winters, uh, but I'll support this, even though it may mean I have a, a reduced chance of drawing in the future. So uh, we have to get away from the point system. We really do. Um, I think it's unfair, especially to our younger hunters. So I will support the bill. Any other comments? Mr. Um, Representative Winter. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, to uh, Representative Burkhardt's comment, I have no preference points. <laughs> Uh, I have killed two sheep, one moose, and a grizzly bear. So, um, but my my concern is um, I do, I just don't think I can support this. I know there's a lot of work done on it, but I really think it needs to go to an interim committee and discuss it a little more, and and uh, maybe not have quite so many people having an, having uh, opinions. Um, so that's my position. Any other comments? I think we're ready to vote. Barb, if you would call the roll. Representative Angelos? Aye. Representative Burkhart? Aye. Representative Byron? Aye. Representative Larson? Aye. Representative Singh? No. Representative Storer? Aye. Vice Chairman Western? Was that, yeah? Oh, sorry. Representative Winter? No. Uh, Madam Chairman Newsom? Six aye, three no. Okay. Um, Chairman Burkhart, would you be interested in taking this on the floor? 
not really. I don't really want the abuse. Um, <laughs> uh, and I wasn't here for the previous discussions. Okay. Um, I know that we don't, I don't want to argue about it. I, I, I know that Representative Western is really passionate about the issue, maybe more okay. so than I am. So if he wants it, but I will take it. I will present it on the floor if okay. you wish. Uh, that would be good since I am not a hunter. Okay, I guess that wraps us up for today. Thank you everyone for your robust conversation and um, thank you, Joe, for coming down to present for us.